I knew better. My mother raised me better. Nice girls don't do things like that. I never should have gone to that bar on the edge of town. I knew not to take a stranger home, but I was drunk and he was cute and it was the last cold snap of the spring and the heater in my drafty old apartment was broken. I fell asleep with my back pressed against his solid warmth. But I woke up in the dark before sunrise and I was cold again. He had slipped out sometime in the night. I felt deflated and a bit foolish. That's what you get, I told myself. I grabbed an extra blanket and closed the window. It was a couple of days later that the itching started. It was intense and originated somewhere deep inside me, somewhere that couldn't be scratched. It was manageable at first with a tube of cream from the drugstore, but the itch eventually burned through every temporary solution I applied. It radiated from the tender center of my body and drove me mad. Nothing helped. I tried not to scratch at the delicate flesh down there, but it got to the point that I couldn't help it. And then the smell began. I hid myself in embarrassment and started avoiding people. Even though nobody could see my condition, I worried that they can smell that cloying organic smell. It soaked through the layers of my clothes, a noxious blend of late summer flowers and rotting meat. It lingered on the back of my tongue. It clung to every chair I sat in, wafted from the crotch of every pair of pants I owned. Wearing a skirt was out of the question. I risked it one hot summer day when my air conditioner had frozen over. I nearly vomited from the fetid stench that unfurled beneath my dress and was held captive by the motionless air. It didn't matter how many times I showered or how thoroughly I scrubbed myself. The smell was inexorable, slowly leaching back out from the inside of me. I launched an internal investigation one day during a particularly heavy-handed bath. It felt strange in there, the usual softness interrupted by some sort of firm, gelatinous shape that provoked no sensation when prodded. It felt like touching my foot after it falls asleep. Touching it made me feel nauseous. Everything made me feel nauseous. I kept having nightmares about pale, distended grubs writhing beneath the surface of my skin, falling out of my mouth, falling out of other places. I knew something was wrong, but a trip to the doctor wasn't in the budget. The pieces clicked one day when I was writing a shopping list and thought about how long it had been since I'd bought tampons. I finally went to the clinic. I didn't have health insurance, so I was shuffled to the bottom of the list. I sat gingerly on one of the faded fabric chairs, shifting and sweating as my nether regions itched mercilessly beneath my clothes. The smell, oh god, the smell was permeating my jeans already. The waiting room was thick with it, syrupy and rancid. I had to pee so badly by the time they called me back that I made a mess trying to collect a sample in the little plastic cup. The test, the test was positive. They pried me open with a cold metal instrument they called a speculum and peeped inside of me. This was followed by an uncomfortable invasion by a gloved hand. As the familiar stink bloomed in the small examination room, a heavy flush of shame settled over me. Huh, said the doctor from behind her mask. That's odd. <laughs> I floated down the hallway to the ultrasound room in a daze. It only got more confusing. When the tech smeared the thick plastic wand with the clear jelly and slid it up inside me, there was nothing there. No heartbeat. No fetus. Nothing. On the fuzzy gray screen, but a neatly folded womb that gave no sign of ever having been inhabited. 
The tech was baffled and consulted at length in the hallway with the doctor and the nurse. I waited, shivering in my thin hospital gown, until they returned. They told me there was nothing to be done. <laughs> False pregnancy is like that, they said. You just have to wait it out. Eventually, your body will realize that it's decorating for a guest that will never arrive. What about the other stuff, I said. What about the... You know. What about the smell? They were polite about it. Probably a minor bacterial infection. But they'd run an STD panel and let me know for sure by the end of the week. They offered me a cheap course of generic antibiotics and a topical cream that I couldn't afford. I thanked them, and went home with the speculum I had stolen tucked into my purse. When I got home, I washed it thoroughly and then laid down a towel on the bed. I made sure a source of light and a hand mirror were nearby. It took me a few tries to get it inserted properly. Once I had it in place, I reached cautiously between my legs and felt around in the gap afforded by the instrument. Something, something was definitely wrong. It felt distressingly unfamiliar, crammed with alien folds that resisted my prodding. I pushed deeper blindly. Something was blocking the way. It felt fleshy, round, and it spasmed when my finger made contact. My stomach turned. I pulled away. I grabbed the hand mirror, trying to position it between my legs so that I can see between the stainless steel jaws that propped me open. The light was tricky. Everything had to be angled just right. Something metallic glinted from the depths of the shadowy opening, something lodged deeper than the speculum. I frowned and hunched closer, peering into the mirror. Something round and silver looked back. It it blinked. The mirror fell to the floor in a tinkle of broken glass. I yanked the speculum out of me with a disgusting slurp. It clanked as it fell beside the remains of the mirror. No, 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 no. I burrowed into the blankets, pulling them over my head. I kept my legs clamped shut and imagined I could feel something throbbing, wriggling, trying to squirm its way out. A hot, prickly wave of nausea washed over me. I fumbled with the window latch and sagged against the sill as the cool air flooded in. Pulling the covers back over my head, I fell into an uneasy sleep. I dreamed that I was floating above my body, watching a wet, pale, glistening thing unfold itself slowly from between my legs as I slept. It squirmed, contracting and expanding as it oozed out of my body. Thick, clear fluid gushed out of me with each rhythmic convulsion. It went on and on and on. It was... It was almost as long as me, when it finally pulled free in one last vicious spurt. It left a slippery trail behind as it dragged itself inch by pulsating inch to the open windowsill. The next morning, the itching had finally stopped. I was so relieved that I cried. An inserted finger confirmed that my internal structure was once more soft and blessedly normal. No trace of the tightly coiled mass I had glimpsed the night before. I was finally free. The smell, though, the smell lingered. I washed my sheets three times, and still I could smell it. Whatever crawled out of me had left a wide gray stain that dried stiff and wouldn't come out no matter how many times I pre-treated it. I finally gave up and resigned myself to sleeping on a bare mattress. I flipped it over to escape the stain, but the smell still drifted up to haunt my nostrils from beneath. Still, 
I figured I would fall asleep as easily as breathing in the absence of that godforsaken itch. I quickly realized that I had celebrated too soon. My room was suffocatingly hot. My clothes twisted around me, strangling and uncomfortable until I stripped them off and found that my body had not yet run out of tricks. My breasts were swollen and throbbing, like they were full of liquid fire. They had doubled, nearly tripled in size. They looked absurdly like overripe fruits dangling from my chest, shiny and purple and about to split. Sharp bolts of pain stabbed through them every time I shifted in a fruitless attempt to find a position that didn't hurt. My teeth chattered as if I were cold, but I was so hot I was sweating. The air in my bedroom felt stuffy and closed, and, and the smell, the smell, the smell was everywhere, coating my lungs. I opened the window a crack, sighing in relief as, as the cool night air kissed my inflamed skin. I don't know how I managed to fall asleep. I dreamed of dripping roots and fat pink earthworms reaching blindly through the dirt. My teeth rotting and crumbling and falling out of my mouth. Tiny bats sinking their fangs into the sleeping necks of cows. In every dream, a tide of dull pain flowed in and out of my chest, and the taste of old sugar and decay lingered in my mouth. In every dream, I was cold. It was the chill breeze blowing in from the open window that finally woke me. My breasts no longer hurt. They hung soft and small as I lay curled on my side. There was a half-dollar spot on the mattress beneath them where some kind of white fluid had pooled and dried in the night, leaving nothing but a pearlescent film that dissipated in the morning sun. The bed was rumpled beside me, streaked with mud and weeds. In the hollow of the other pillow was a single downy feather. The room smelled sweetly and faintly of rot. It didn't last. The milk returned with a vengeance, and by evening I was even worse than before. But I left the window open and it happened again the next night and the next. For a time it was almost sustainable. I went to bed with my breasts full and aching, but woke up relieved. Sometimes the dirt in the bed was pale riverbank sand or thick smears of red clay. Sometimes there were shreds of golden moss or tattered brown leaves or little green worms. The feathers were always silver. But soon, inevitably, the milk was not enough. I was sleeping more soundly than I should have been. My dreams were tangled and confusing, full of rustling wings and scuttling shadows with too many legs. I woke up feeling drained. My breasts hung shriveled and empty in the mornings, which seemed to come later and later each day. The, the, um, the areolas bloomed with bruises, fleshy auroras of purple and blue, to match the shadows under my eyes. I slept for 12, 13, 14 hours at a time, but somehow I never felt rested. It wasn't until I awoke to thick crusts of dried blood on my nipples that I realized what I was going to have to do. <sighs> it's not what nice girls do. I went back to that bar on the edge of town. It seemed like the only place to pick up another stranger. I caught myself looking for the first one, but to be honest, I couldn't even remember his face. Only his shoulders, and the smell of the alcohol in his breath, like late summer flowers and rotting meat. I thought to look for the smell, but it was already in my nose, so it was everywhere. In the end, any warm body would do. I just picked one that seemed willing. Everyone has nipples. I took him home and waited while he grunted and panted and finally collapsed on top of me, waiting for the part where he rolled over and fell into a contented sleep, waiting for the rustle of feathers at the open window. When it came, I turned away and pressed my back against his solid warmth, ignoring the jostling movements, the hot trickling wetness, the sounds. 
It all eventually stopped. I bit my lip and held my breath, still waiting. Feathers. Silver feathers drifting across the pillow like snow. A heavy gust of air that carried a sour copper tang to my nose, laced with sweetness and rot. A cold, empty space opened up at my back before the window slammed shut against the sudden wind. The milk has dried up now, and I keep my windows locked. I don't go to that bar anymore. Nice girls don't do things like that. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you so much for listening to tonight's story, whether it be an episode of something or tonight's podcast or tonight's YouTube. I hope all of you are staying safe in the current uh, pandemic craziness. If you guys are missing out on some of the artwork from some of your favorite artists, uh, you can always check out the description down below where I'm linking over some of my friends who are not able to do conventions, seeing as all the conventions this year have currently been um, shut down. So if you're missing out on some of the incredible artwork you can normally get from them, a uh, group of my friends, or a lot of different friends of mine, are all found in the description down below. And a very big thank you to all my Patreons, and you can always join them at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. People like Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chapinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, G Weevil 3, Diana Kraus, Stephen Van Huss, Chance Burnett, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cal, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Sinner, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Paulson, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Macedo, Thomas Burgett, Azazel Rotten, Let's Get Scared, S-Man, Andrew Kirasuba Warnock, Bad Honey, Creepypasta Adam, Someone You Love, Brennan Wright, Said The King 56, and Somber Puppet. Thank you guys so much for your continued support to all of you on Patreon, you guys that are down there in the description and everyone else. And thank you all for listening and watching and being subscribed. Sweet dreams. <laughs>